Now you mentioned a moment ago, mountain sickness. What is the difference between mountain sickness and high altitude cerebral edema? And, and did you start to have um, all of those sort of symptoms relating to the um, cerebral edema? Well, they are all related, you're right. Um, altitude sickness manifests itself, first of all, in the form of a headache. And what's happening is that your brain craves oxygen. And in an, this is a very poor description, but um, basically the, the, the parts of your cells of the outer part of the brain swells up to increase its surface area so it can assimilate more oxygen. And that gives you a headache because you, you've got a swelling in your brain and that feels like a headache. Uh, cerebral edema is the extreme uh, end of that swelling process where the intracranial pressure, you know, the problem is you have a skull, so a certain amount of swelling will actually crush the cortex and you'll die. And along the way, the symptoms are, are progressively like you can find headaches followed by vomiting, followed by um, loss of balance or ataxia or, or complete exhaustion, inability to talk. Um, and, and then death. And the only way to reverse those symptoms is to descend immediately to a lower altitude. And that wasn't an option for us. So it then became, well, we didn't know what was wrong with me. Jack was fine, but um, uh, we made the only other choice that seemed sensible. It was, was, was hightail it to the summit as fast as we could, knowing mm. that once we'd crossed the summit, the west buttress of Denali is just a walk by comparison, you know, it's a serious climb, lots of people get killed on it, but I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a snow slope um, that you can walk down pretty much, you know. Um, and we knew that we would encounter lots of other climbers if we could do that, because the West Buttress is the popular way. Um, but I got very ill and, um, you know, the onset was gradual at first and then relentless. And, um, we managed to climb through all of the difficult rock climbing sections and we were exhausted, so we bivouacked, um, found a place to put the tent up um, above that and took a rest day there as well, hoping that I would acclimatise and, and get better. But, you know, people know a lot more about cerebral edema now than, than they did then, and we did nothing about it. In fact, just once you've got the onset of those symptoms, you will not acclimatise. Hmm. Uh, you know, it's a one-way street. And it's, it's all getting worse. You know, being up there is not helping you um, to get over it. It's making it worse. And um, we managed to get all the way up to about, oh, like I want to say, 18, 7 or 19,000 feet. And we reached the Cassine Ridge, which was the climb that our two friends had, had been planning to climb. And uh, I collapsed. I uh, couldn't even sit up. Uh, I was taking a, I was sitting down taking a picture and I said, Jack, I can't get up. And uh, he tried dragging me um, and me crawling. The first thought was, oh, come on, we can crawl over the summit of the hmm. uh, and get onto the easy ground. But I couldn't even do that. So we had to put the tent up and we wound up staying, staying several days in, 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 in that spot. Um, him with the onset of really serious frostbite and me descending into uh, near coma moments. Um, we hadn't eaten. Uh, we'd run out of food a couple of days before. So uh, we were not only cold and very ill but also starving hmm. and, and, and were you like coherent at all in this state i remember bits of it um but the answer is no i don't remember all of it at all i look at the pictures and i can i can recognize myself in them. i was able to write the book only because jack was one of I mean, all americans seem to like to write journals I mean, there must be something they're trying to do in school or something and um, <laughs> they all do it all of my friends do anyway um, <laughs> And he wrote about what was happening and he was tearing himself in pieces, um, not knowing what to do, whether to stay with me and die with me or he tried to drag me over the summit again. That didn't work. And he, he had the most awful dilemma for him to, to, to stay there and we'll definitely both die or to try and go for the summit on his own and get down the other side and alert anybody, uh, you know, maybe to be able to organize a rescue. Sounds good when you say it, but the reality of it is that there's no one who's ever going to rescue me. You know, the people who climb Denali have enough trouble getting to the summit, let alone going down the other side you know, to, to hmm. help somebody. No, it's just not going to happen. So, anyway, he didn't have to. 
Sorry. Yeah, you know, he 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 carried that around with him for the rest of his life. I discovered you know, that 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 time, um, and um, he was fixing to, to leave. Um, he left me with the stove and you know my personal gear in the tent, and he was going to go for it himself. And just at that moment, he was uh, relieved from that awful decision because um, Bob Candy came and Mike Helms turned up. These are the guys that we've met mm. lower down. And they'd been even slower than us. We thought they'd be long gone on Cassine Ridge because it's not our hardest the climb we'd done. But they, they turned up and found Jack. And uh, we all sat down together. They had some tea. And I remember somebody giving me some tea and this conversation that went on about me. And the decision was taken that Jack would go with Mike over the summit because Mike had been over the summit before and knew the way. And that Bob possibly the bravest decision I've ever seen, volunteered to stay with me. Um, now bear in mind that Bob was severely worried about his own well-being and survival long before he met us. You know, he had had a reasonably tough time on the casino and they were looking forward to, to, to getting out from under the, the, the risk themselves. And Bob, to do that, you know, to, to stay behind to save the life of a stranger was the most extraordinary human act. And, and you, I think you mentioned in, in the chat I listened to that he gave a note, was it to Jack, to give to his family? Yeah, he, he wrote a note to his parents, um, just in case, uh, explaining what he was doing. And um, Jack also had a note in his, in his diary, in his, his journal, that I must have dictated to him because we found it uh, years later. And it was a list of my girlfriend, my parents, my best friends, you know, and their phone numbers. <laughs> Just in case, you know, I was never heard of again. So, it's as close as you can come, I think, to, to, to dying and then not. So. Sure. So, so you, I mean, you can't even imagine the, the feelings that, that obviously Bob was going through, uh, Jack. I mean, everyone is there for you and you are sort of incapacitated to do anything about it, which is also really tough on you because you, you know, maybe you weren't with it at that point, but it's obviously has its impact on you not being able to help. Um, but they, as you mentioned, had their diaries and I, I guess it can't all be, all be easy to read. How, how was it for you to read their diary entries oh, later on? It wasn't easy at all. <clears throat> I mean, particularly Jack's diaries, you know, he, was tearing himself to pieces psychologically over what was going on. Um, Bob? Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy Cape Fold Mountain.